Cue up the LeBron James It's About Damn Time gifts because the Chicago Blackhawks have finally put an end to their road losing skid. After 22 consecutive losses on the road, the Blackhawks bested the Arizona Coyotes 5-2 at Mullet Arena last night. And on today's episode, I'll share my key takeaways from the win, plus an updated look at the Tankathon standings, and also share my final thoughts as we're now just 48 hours away from the 2024 NHL trade deadline. All that and plenty more right here on Locked On Blackhawks. Your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everyone? Welcome on into another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can go and give me a follow on X at Jack Bushman, too. And make sure to also go and follow my strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. And also, to everyone watching this out there on YouTube right now, a quick reminder to please go and smash that like button, comment down below, and subscribe for Celebrini. If you happen to be listening to this through an audio platform today, like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure that you're downloading all of the latest episodes there as well. Well, won't cost you anything, 100% free. Go and rate and review the show too. That always helps me out tremendously. And I also got to let you know, today's episode is brought to you by the Sleeper app, the go-to platform for daily fantasy sports. And right now, if you go and use the promo code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps, then you'll get up to an $100 match on your first deposit with Sleeper. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you all for joining me on another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, your one-stop shop for all things Chicago Blackhawks. And after a miserable 5 nothing loss to the Colorado Avalanche on Monday, the second time that they got UC Eustis Ananind in a five-day stretch, also the second time that they lost 5 to nothing to the Avs in five days as well. It was kind of an eerily similar game also to uh, the contest last Thursday at the United Center, where the Hawks, they hung in there during the opening 20 minutes. They actually had the shots on goal advantage after the first period once again, but after the Avs kicked off the scoring, it really kind of swung the momentum in their favor. They were able to break the game open. Hawks couldn't find ways to contain either Nathan McKinnon or Kale McCarr. They were just simply too much to handle. That pushed the Blackhawks losing skid to 22 consecutive games as they were shut out for the uh, second time in five days to the Avalanche and the ninth time in the regular season as well. It was also their 15th loss in their last 16 games, their 30th in their last 36. But I promise that's going to be all the negative talk we're going to have on the show here today, Blackhawks fans, because finally we got something good to talk about. The Blackhawks finally get back in the W column on the road with a 5-2 to two win over the struggling Arizona Coyotes, a team that was uh, recently coming off of a 14-game losing skid of their own. And I'll tell you what, it was very apparent to me throughout the course of this game why the Yotes had been struggling so bad recently because, to put it simply, they just play a losing brand of hockey, or at least they did that for sure last night. Like, taking a lot of penalties, a couple of them, also occurred right after they had some momentum, right after they had just scored some goals. Too many men on the ice, uh, a poor penalty kill, passing up on primetime scoring opportunities. It was pretty noticeable why the Coyotes have been struggling so heavily as of late. But uh, And it honestly felt a lot like what we've been watching the Blackhawks go through over the last couple of months. But yes, nice to see the Blackhawks take advantage of this struggling Yotes squad to Pick up their first road win, believe it or not, since November 9th, 2023, well over, what's that, four months? Uh, An unbelievable stretch for the Blackhawks on the road. I couldn't believe that it lasted this long. Kind of similar comments by everyone in the locker room falling the win, but um, yeah, finally putting it to an end at the mullet with a 5-2 to two W over the Coyotes. And what really was the culprit for this for the Blackhawks was just a power play explosion in the desert. They scored four power play goals en route to their win last night. They hadn't scored four power play goals in a single game 
since all the way back in 2018, January 9th against the Ottawa Senators, which funny enough was a game that I actually do remember watching in my old basement, eating some Lou Malnati's. I remember it was the game Richard Panic snapped his long gold drought for the Hawks only to end up getting traded the next day. And as someone actually, uh, pointed out on social media, Brent Seabrook was actually a healthy scratch in that game. And then, uh, came out with a little bit of a fire in his belly in the next one and scored the first goal against the Minnesota Wild. But yeah, a power play explosion for the Blackhawks last night, which is really nice to see because they've struggled on the man advantage all year long, dead last in the NHL in that department coming into this game. And I, I did feel like really ever since Seth Jones had come back, Connor Bedard had gotten back. The Blackhawks were creating better looks on their man advantage, and I did think they were starting to implement a little bit more of a shoot-first mentality, but they just weren't getting any bounces. They weren't getting any puck luck. And kind of looking at the teams that they have been facing in the last few weeks, it felt like all the opposing teams were getting all of the breaks. And then this one, the Blackhawks, it felt like they started to get some luck back on their side. Seth Jones kicks off the scoring with the power play goal in the first period, believe it or not. His first power play goal of the season and just his second goal of the year, man. I'll have a little bit more thoughts on uh, Seth Jones and his lack of goal scoring during segment two. So make sure to stay tuned to that point. But his one timer on a five on three gets deflected off of Troy Stetcher's stick out in front. That put the Blackhawks, excuse me, ahead one to nothing. And then uh, after the uh, Coyotes were able to tie the game up one to one early on in the second, right after another power play opportunity for the Blackhawks. Connor Bedard sets up Nick Felino for his team leading sixth power play goal of the season, also his 15th tally of the year. And then again, after the Coyotes go on to tie the game two to two, the Blackhawks respond with two late power play goals in the middle frame. The first one coming from Jason Dickinson. This one was probably the most beautiful one of the four. Kevin Korchinski making a pass to Dickinson, who was open there in the slot for a redirect. Those are the types of plays, those heads up passes from Kevin Korchinski quarterbacking the power play, or as we saw in the loss on Monday to the Arizona Coyotes, the stretch passes that he can make from the D zone to the <clears throat> all the way up to the offensive zone. Those are the types of plays that make him a special offensive minded type of defenseman. And those are the exact type of plays that we want to be seeing more and more out of him as he, I believe he'll only start to get a larger role running the Blackhawks power play, especially given Seth Jones' struggles in that department since coming over from the Columbus Blue Jackets. But a perfect, perfect feed from Kevin Korchinski to find Jason Dickinson in the slot. That gave him his team-leading 18th goal of the season as he leaped Connor Bedard, does the certified goal scorer. And then Philip Kurashev with the fourth PPG of the night, right off an offensive zone draw. Nick Foligno uh, sets him up for the one-timer at the right point, and he blows it home for his 11th goal of the season. That really set the tone for the Blackhawks the rest of the way in. I think gave them the motivation to go out and have a really strong third period at even strength. Because if you go and look at the five on five numbers, it's not like the Blackhawks were dominating this game against the Coyotes. It was actually a pretty closely contested game at even strength. The Hawks were just the team that took advantage in the special teams department, but in the third period, they played their best period of this game, in my opinion, at even strength. They held the Arizona Coyotes off of the scoreboard limited them to only eight shots on goal, were able to hang on to snap their 22-game road losing skid. Seth Jones goes on to add the empty netter for a second goal of the game and the third goal of the season, and the Blackhawks get back in the W column on the road for the first time since November 9th, first time since Philip Kershev got stung by a jellyfish. And the best part about it, Blackhawks fans, is the win didn't move them out of last place. Coming up in just a moment, I will get into an updated look at the Tankathon standings and some of my other key takeaways from the 5-2 win at Mullet Arena. 
But first, I need to talk to you all about Sleeper. A new NHL season brings all sorts of possibilities. Connor Bedard could be on his way to winning the Calder Trophy as NHL Rookie of the Year. Austin Matthews looks like he's going to be winning the Rocket Richard Trophy and could be scoring 70 goals this season. And how about the Vancouver Canucks? Could be shocking everyone in winning the President's Trophy. And you could be winning alongside them by playing daily fantasy hockey with Sleeper, the official daily fantasy app of the Lockdown NHL Network. And Sleeper is our number one choice for daily fantasy sports and especially daily fantasy hockey because with Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash in daily fantasy contests. And all you have to do is simply select whether studs like Nathan McKinnon, Connor McDavid, or Connor Bedard will record more or less than their Sleeper projections for goals, assists, points, shots, and more in any given game. And again, Sleeper offers you the chance to win 100 times your cash. So start paying attention, make the correct picks, and you could be winning real big. And right now, you can also go and use the promo code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps to get up to an $100 match on your first deposit with Sleeper. Even if you just want to Deposit $50. Sleeper will match you on that as well. You just have to use the promo code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps, and you can go and see Sleeper's terms of use right now if you're wanting more details. Segment two, not only did the Blackhawks pick up a win on the road last night, but, uh, well, it was also just their second win since January 19th, well before the NHL All-Star break, which is Hard to fathom that they've only won twice since the NHL All-Star break. What is going on, man? It has been a tough stretch for this team. But on the bright side, with this win last night, it also didn't cost the Blackhawks last place or first place, however you want to look at it, in the suck hard. I guess that was suck hard for Bedard. Sorry. Suck weenie for Celebrini. Slacking for Macklin. However you want to put it. Sweepstakes. Blackhawks still are dead last in the NHL standings. Technically, thanks to the San Jose Sharks getting a point last night in their game with the Dallas Stars as it went into overtime. Although, it looked like the Blackhawks were going to have sole possession of last place in terms of points, if you will. Because... The San Jose Sharks had a 6-3 to three lead over the Dallas Stars going, or it was 5-3 to three going into the third. They scored a goal a couple minutes into the final period to extend their lead to 6-3. to three. I go, oh boy, the Blackhawks win and the Sharks win on the same night. The Hawks get to stay in last place. Well, in typical Sharks fashion, they end up blowing their three-goal lead in the third period only to lose to the Dallas Stars 7-6 to six in overtime. But they do pick up a point in that one, and that, Technically, it still has the Blackhawks in last place. Both teams currently have 37 points, but the Hawks have a two nine have a point two nine three points percentage through 63 games so far this season. While the San Jose Sharks, who also have 37 points, like I said, but they have a point three oh three points percentage through 61 games. So the Blackhawks still have two more games played than the Sharks at this point in time. And just for a reference. The Anaheim Ducks are in third last place in the standings, but they still have 47 points on the year, 10 points more than the Sharks and the Hawks. Really think it's going to be a two-horse race for who's going to finish last in the NHL standings. But as I talked about a few episodes ago, not exactly the most difficult schedule coming up for the Chicago Blackhawks. Now, (laughs) they still have to go out there and win those games, and considering they've only won 16 times out of 63 games this season, I'm not going to put it past them, but they do have a much easier schedule coming up here in the month of March, and games coming up, uh, they'll wrap up their three-game road trip this weekend with a matchup out in Washington against the Capitals. But after that, they'll come back home for a matchup against the Arizona Coyotes once again on Sunday. Then they'll take on the Anaheim Ducks at the UC next Tuesday. And they'll also have a matchup with the Los Angeles Kings on Friday night. While the San Jose Sharks, uh, it's a lot more difficult for them. Thursday, their next game of action, they'll be taking on the New York Islanders who are trying to stay alive for their postseason hopes. They'll have the Ottawa Senators in their next game after that. Could be an opportunity for San Jose to get a win. And then on Tuesday, they'll travel out to Pennsylvania for a matchup with the Flyers on Tuesday and then a game on Thursday in Pittsburgh against the Penguins. So uh, I do believe the Hawks 
have the more easy schedule of these two teams, but uh, still got to go out there and win in order to creep up the standings. And again, they haven't been doing a lot of that this season. So we'll see how this ends up shaking out throughout the next week. But the Blackhawks still are technically in last place, despite getting a win last night, thanks to the San Jose Sharks also picking up a point in their OT loss to the Dallas Stars. But quickly getting into some of my other takeaways that I wanted to be sure to bring up from last night's win over the Coyotes. Got to talk about Arvid Satterbloom, Blackhawks fans, because not only did the Blackhawks snap their 22-game road losing streak, but Arvid Satterbloom also picked up a win for the first time since November 24th. I also can't believe this skid has been going on for this long. Uh, The last time Satterbloom got a win, believe it or not, was all the way back on that crazy Black Friday comeback win uh, against the Toronto Maple Leafs. And this was actually the first time this season that Arvid Soderbloom had beaten a team not named the Toronto Maple Leafs. His two wins up to this point had both come against Toronto. One, I think, was the fourth or third game of the season uh, up in Toronto. And the last one was, yes, that crazy Black Friday game where the Hawks came back and won in overtime as Connor Bedard set up Kevin Korchinski for the OT winner. But a really strong performance out of Arvid Soderbloom last night. The only real blunder he had, I think you could say, was on uh, Michael Carcone's goal, the second goal of the night for the Coyotes, as he was just caught being a little bit too aggressive and came way too far out of his net. But aside from that, I thought he was rather sharp and The Coyotes had a good start to this game, Blackhawks fans. They tallied 17 shots on goal in the opening 20 minutes. Arvid Soderbloom stopped all 17 of them to really get settled into this game. And looking at his past four starts prior to this one, uh, in all four of them, he had given up a goal in the opening 10 minutes. So by preventing that last night against the Coyotes, I think that really set him up for success the rest of the way. He ended up stopping 37 of the 39 shots that he faced. And like I said, I think the only blunder that you could, uh, or the only thing you could kind of nitpick about his game was that goal that he gave up to Michael Carcone. But nice to see him hold an opponent to under three goals. It was the first time that he had done that since uh, January 2nd against the Nashville Predators, even though I do think genuinely he has been playing better comparatively over the last couple of months. Something that's always a talking point for me is he just hasn't been able to steal games. And especially when he's allowing three or four, every time he's out there, just hard for this struggling Blackhawks offense. That's dead last in the NHL to match that and go and get enough to get a win for Arvid Soderbloom. But with four power play goals last night, they were able to give him enough run support to pick up his first victory Uh, in over three months as well. Had to feel good for Arvid Soderbloom, and I thought he had a pretty funny quote after the game as well. He said, I feel like I've been close a couple of times, but we fucked it up, so it was nice to get it all the way this time. Couldn't have said it better myself, Arvid. Uh, I mentioned on the last episode on Monday, I don't know how many more starts he's going to be getting here down the stretch because of his struggles. This one... Um, I don't know if it's going to change the mind of the coaching staff or whatnot as to his workload the rest of the way, but has to give them at least a little bit more confidence that um, he can finish this season on a high note after it's been a rather disappointing first full NHL campaign for the Hawks backup goaltender. Also, I did want to be sure to mention that after 20 minutes in this game last night, the Blackhawks led one to nothing. That was the first time they've led after the first period following the NHL All-Star break. Since the beginning of February, not only do the Blackhawks, did they only have one win coming into last night's game since the start of February, they hadn't even led in a game after 20 minutes since before the All-Star break, man. That just goes to tell you another statistic as to how brutal it has been here lately for the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, Yeah, hopefully they'll be having some more leads moving forward because it's Just not a team that is meant to be playing comeback hockey all the time. I also got to give a shout out to Tyler Johnson. He entered last night's game with six assists and 47 games worth of action. He picked up three on the power play in his first nine minutes of ice time in this game. Now has uh, nine assists on the season, and that actually gives him eight points 
three goals and five assists in 13 games since returning from injury. And of course, Tyler Johnson is someone that one of the few members of the Blackhawks that could possibly be dealt here at the NHL trade deadline, which I'll get more into here in just a second, certainly isn't hurting his stock by the way that he's been playing as of late. Nice to see Tyler be an effective player since uh, coming back from that lower body injury. And then we got to talk about Seth Jones, Blackhawks fans. As I mentioned during segment one, Seth Jones scored his first power play goal of the season last night. And if you remember, the, the power play has been such an issue for this Blackhawks team the last couple of years, even at the end of Patrick Kane's tenure. But it's really been a problem ever since Seth Jones has came here. And he's been the guy who's been quarterbacking the Blackhawks power play for a wide majority of that time. In his first season with the Chicago Blackhawks, not only did he not score a power play goal, the Blackhawks went the entire season without getting a power play goal from a defenseman. Last year, Seth Jones only had two power play goals. He's now played 198 games with the Chicago Blackhawks. He has three power play goals to show for it. And again, it's not like he's someone who's out there on the second unit from time to time. No, he's been the guy who's been running it at the point. And I will say, like I mentioned in segment one, I do think he and the Blackhawks man advantage as a whole have had more of a shoot first mentality here as of late. And there has been some progress, but make no mistake about it. For the money that he's making, and I don't dog Seth Jones a lot for the money. Um, Anyone would have signed that contract had it been placed in front of him. It's not his fault he got overpaid. Again, it is Stan Bowman's problem. And is Seth Jones overpaid? Yeah, absolutely. But he is still a valuable defenseman. And I hate that Blackhawks fans let the money just kind of blind them as to what kind of player Seth Jones is. Because he and Alex Vlasic have been one of the few bright spots for this Blackhawks team all season long in the top pairing that they've been able to create. But offensively, it's just not good enough from Seth Jones. Looking at some of the numbers, entering last night's game, and I know he missed some time with injury, Reese Johnson had more goals this season than Seth Jones. And I know Seth's a defenseman, but come on, man. This is a guy who scored 16 in a season before. Guy who scored 12 last year for the Blackhawks. To have one goal coming into this point of the season, and to it had to be, it was his 47th game of the year. Took him 47 games to score a power play goal. Come on, man. Nikita Zaitsev had more goals than he did coming into last night. Same with Connor Murphy. It's just not acceptable. Seth Jones has to be better. And I think his puck moving and his zone entries on the power play have been fine. But the production just hasn't been there. And I don't know if, I quite honestly, I don't know if the Blackhawks have been going with the same power play strategies for the last couple of years, if they've had the same coaching staff or the same member of the coaching staff running the power play. It's probably something I should look into a little bit more. But that guy has to get canned. Something has to change here. And look, I was happy to see four power play goals last night, but over the course of the season, the Blackhawks power play has been awful. It's been God awful. And that was actually something going into this year that I thought was going to be a bright spot for this team. If you listen to my bold predictions going into this year, I had the Blackhawks finishing as a top 15, maybe even a top 10 power play in the NHL. They're still dead freaking last. And part of that is because they haven't been getting any goals from their defensemen. And with Connor Bedard being the weapon that he is, it's such a good opportunity for the defensemen to get off shots because of the respect that Connor Bedard has to command on the power play. And Seth Jones just hasn't taken advantage of that this season. And I I really do wonder if Kevin Korchinski winds up being quarterback one on the power play next year. I know he hasn't looked great on the man advantage either, but these numbers from Seth, they're unfathomably bad. I, I don't understand how... He has gone from such a good offensive defenseman in his career to really providing not a whole lot of a shot on the back end for the Blackhawks on their man advantage. It, re- it really kind of blows my mind, and I, I just wonder, something has to change is basically what I'm getting to. Yeah, I'm happy that the Blackhawks broke through for four goals last night, but 
Um, we need more out of Seth offensively. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, especially for the money that he's making, which I don't bring up a ton, but come on, dog. You're almost making 10 mil a year. You got to have more than one power play goal a year and three in 200 games with the Chicago Blackhawks. It's pretty unacceptable in my opinion. Last takeaway that I had before I get into some thoughts on the NHL trade deadline, which is just two days away, a pretty quiet game from Mr. Connor Bedard. And honestly, the Blackhawks, uh, top line at even strength, which I should mention, Nick Foligno was back bump up there with Bedard and Philip Kurashev. Ryan Donato dropped back down to a bottom six role, which, you know, I don't hate. Um, just kind of some tinkering going on by Luke Richardson, but not the most effective night out of counter Bedard and that Blackhawks top line. But what I love to see is Bedard still finding a way to make an impact in this game with two primary assists on the Blackhawks power play. And those are the types of games that he is still capable of having. Like we know he's not going to be, especially with the supporting cast that he has um, an effective player night in and night out. It's just so difficult for him to do that at 18 years of age. But where I, like I said, expected the Blackhawks to be very productive this season was on the power play. And I really thought that's where Connor Bedard was going to flash his skills. Nice to see him not let his struggles at five on five kind of translate over to impacting how the Hawks played on the man advantage. I thought they moved the puck around very well all night long. Bedard had a couple of nifty assists. Tyler Johnson was some good work along the boards as well. And Seth Jones did provide that shoot first mentality that we need to see more of going forward. But just nice to see the Blackhawks, big dogs, take things over on the power play like I thought they could going into the season. Hopefully we see more of that with 19 games to go on the 2024 schedule. All right, there are my final thoughts from the Blackhawks. 5-2 to two win over the Coyotes last night. Coming up in just a moment, I still have to get into some of my final thoughts ahead of the 2024 NHL trade deadline. But first, I got to talk to you all about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience is what brings home the winning trophy. And it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and to level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or else you'll get your money back. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. With all the parts that you need at the prices you actually want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and to bring home that win. Again, that's ebaymotors.com. Back here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Again, just a reminder to please go and smash that like button, comment down below, and subscribe to the Lockdown Blackhawks YouTube channel to stay all caught up on the latest Blackhawks news and updates. And also make sure to go and check out the new Lockdown Sports Today because Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And Lockdown Sports Today is here for you 24 7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of lockdown plus our national shows covering every single league so go to lockdown sports today on youtube and make sure you subscribe to the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel all right segment three before i wrap things up today we are Now just 48 hours away from the 2024 NHL trade deadline, things are starting to ramp up here across the NHL scene. But before anything goes down with the Chicago Blackhawks, if that even winds up being the case, I did kind of want to share my final thoughts on this matter and whether or not we will see a move made by general manager Kyle Davidson. And this has just been something that's... uh, been constantly on my mind really over the last two weeks now when the Blackhawks have really been on their losing ways despite having a ton of games on home ice at the United Center. Really up until last night's win against the Arizona Coyotes, oddly enough, this was just kind of a thought that was in my head before going to bed each and every day. Not surprising news here. This Blackhawks team has been doing a lot of losing over the last few months, and they've now dropped 
30 of their last 37 games, 15 of their last 17. They only have two wins since the start of February. And you have to wonder how much all of that losing is weighing on youngsters like Connor Bedard, Kevin Korchinski, Arvid Soderblom, and even older respected veterans who have elected to sign contract extensions here like Jason Dickinson, Nick Foligno, Peter Morazic, hell, even Seth Jones, who waived his no movement clause to get traded to the Blackhawks in hopes to finally go and win some things. Blackhawks haven't been doing a whole lot of winning ever since Seth Jones has arrived. And you have to wonder how much all of that losing is going to factor into the decisions Kyle Davidson is going to make here at the trade deadline. And while I think if there's a deal he absolutely can't say no to, yeah, I do expect him to do it. But I I do wonder if he worries about more losses here in the final 19 games of the season for the Blackhawks and how it's going to continue to affect the mentality in the locker room and what they're trying to get out of these final 19 games and just how it's going to affect some of these young guys and even some of these veterans and just everything that goes into the day-to-day of being an NHL hockey player for this Blackhawks squad. And I don't think losing this much was ever part of the plan this year, Blackhawks fans. I didn't think the Blackhawks were going to make huge strides or anything. I still believed they were going to be a bottom 10 team in the NHL. I didn't envision this happening. And I don't think Kyle Davidson envisioned this happening either. I don't believe he's, you know, upset that he's in the mix for the worst team in the NHL again, considering Macklin Celebrini is looking awfully good. And we'd love to add him to an already pretty stacked prospect pool. But I just don't know how much Kyle Davidson wants to be pushing it with this group. And you have to wonder how much more losing they can take and how much more losing the fans can take because this year has been more brutal than any of the others. And the amount of people that I've seen on social media say, you know, why are we still watching? I missed this game. And just even like the conversations going on on X throughout the course of Blackhawks games. They're dead because of how bad the Chicago Blackhawks are. And I have multiple friends who I grew up watching Blackhawks hockey with. None of them are still watching the Blackhawks on a consistent basis right now. And I can't blame them because the product is terrible. So how much more losing does Kyle Davidson really want to be doing? Fans are getting upset. You know, the season is already lost. I understand that. But how much more losing can the players and the fans take? Maybe not this season. I think it's more important to not be losing as much down the stretch for the players than it is the fans because the fans are already tuned out to this year. But next year, man, the, I really don't think Kyle Davidson and this Blackhawks organization can afford to lose the way that they've been losing this season or the last couple of years because – I even just had a buddy who was at the UC on Saturday in that game against the Columbus Blue Jackets, a weekend game at the UC. He told me it was as dead as a doorknob, the worst atmosphere, not only that he's seen at a Blackhawks game, the worst atmosphere that he's seen at a sports game. I mean, you could hear a pen dropped in there. So how much more of this losing is the Blackhawks front office really going to tolerate? And of course, by only trading Tyler Johnson and Colin Blackwell, yes, they are both unrestricted free agents at the end of the year. And are they going to come back? Who really knows? But I, I still think it's the message that you're sending to the locker room. And you're risking a lot more losses down the stretch of the season by weakening this team even further than they already are. So I just do wonder if, Thinking about the losing is going to impact the decision Kyle Davidson makes on either Tyler Johnson or Colin Blackwell. And at this point in time, Blackhawks fans, sounds like those are only the, the, that sounds like those are the two only guys who are in the conversation to even be traded. And according to Scott Powers of The Athletic, uh, he said that Colin Blackwell seems like the most likely guy to get moved right now with an Eastern Conference, uh, an Eastern Conference scout telling him, quote, I think he would be a good depth ad, but I would think it would be late Friday when that could get done unless some of the depth guys start dropping earlier. So according to Powers, looks like Blackwell is the most likely Blackhawk to get traded at this point in time. But yeah, I really only think it's he or Tyler Johnson that are in the mix. Some other news that Scott Powers dropped 
apologies for my nose running Blackhawks fans. I've been under the weather these last couple of days and it's been brutal. Not as brutal as the Blackhawks play since the start of February, but uh, also according to powers, it sounds like the Blackhawks would be willing to get themselves involved as a third party broker in a trade, which is certainly complicated, but we've seen that happen a couple of times already prior to this year's deadline. So I honestly think that's the most likely move the Blackhawks make is being a third party broker. I, I just don't see it being all that likely that they make deals. Maybe Colin Blackwell ends up going for a um, third or probably even more likely a fourth round selection. I think there's a lot of complications in moving Tyler Johnson. And again, do you really want to be taking pieces away from this forward group when it's already been a struggle for them enough to score goals this year? I I just wonder about that. So we'll see what ends up happening in the next 48 hours before the trade deadline becomes official. Colin Blackwell, Tyler Johnson seem like they're the two names to keep an eye on. But at this point in time, according to the athletic Scott powers, Colin Blackwell is the most likely member of the Blackhawks to get traded. All right. That is going to wrap up today's episode of lockdown Blackhawks as always. Thank you all again for tuning into the show and be sure to go and follow Lockdown Blackhawks for free right now, wherever you may be listening to your podcast and to go and subscribe to Lockdown Blackhawks on YouTube. And that way you can get the latest episode as soon as it becomes available each and every day. As always, I'm your host, Jack Bushman. Go and give me a follow on X at Jack Bushman too. And make sure to go and check out my Strictly Blackhawks account as well at Talk and Hockey for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. So until tomorrow's episode, that's going to do it here for the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network.